like last year, most of the breakthroughs all revolve around cancer genetics uh, and the genes that drive cancer and genes that can be targeted as therapeutic targets to treat cancer. I would probably say one of the things that I've, I've seen my partners and myself using more and more is a uh, new sort of tracking test for cancer, uh, a tumor marker called a Signatera test, where the it, it's a way to detect trace amounts of cancer on a molecular level that's so much more sensitive than the typical standard blood tests we've, we've used in the past as tumor markers. Very interesting test. It uses pieces and DNA fragments from a patient's own biopsy specimen to track their individual cancer and create gene probes for the DNA for their cancer. So it's very interesting. Um, and I think that's become um, much more commonly used over the past year. I think as, as the years evolve, we've really locked into the idea that, you know, the secrets to treating and, you know, curing various forms of cancer lie within the DNA. So the other tests that continue to evolve, and there are more of these types of tests, competing assays, which will only make them better, from different biotechnology firms are the tests that actually check the molecular fingerprint of the cancer cells, looking for gene mutations that uh, we can target with medications. And then probably the other thing, the final thing from a medical oncology perspective would be uh, the, the broadening of the applications for immunotherapy. Well, those are, those are all very big, big advances. And so then we're getting to where we talked about was many years ago um, when I was in graduate school, when you were in graduate school about personalized medicine, right? We're finally uh, getting to that dream where we could actually, instead of giving a, a kind of a grenade to people that works on some and doesn't work on others, we're being able to tailor the medication that you're getting based on your genetics, based on your, your side effect profile based on uh, what other diseases you have. You, ha you hit the nail on the head. I mean, that, that's the whole thing. Rather than, I always tell my patients, rather than sort of the archaic, becoming more archaic carpet bombing of chemotherapy with its titanic toxicities and side effects, and, and you know, in many cases, not so favorable response rates, we're now devising guided missiles that can either complement the broader attack or replace it and be much more effective with far fewer side effects. Right, so I'll, I'll uh, sort of speak to it in terms of collateral damage. So it, if you are able to be more targeted about the therapy that you have, there's less of this collateral damage. And the collateral damage is the stuff, years ago we used to say, well, we got nothing else. We're just gonna deal with the collateral damage later. But nowadays we can, address the collateral damage by making things more targeted. And so in medical oncology, there's more targeted approaches. In surgery, there's definitely more targeted approaches. We're doing more laparoscopy, we're doing more robotics, we're doing more image-guided surgery, et cetera. And then uh, Dr. Sinha wasn't able to be here today, but I'm gonna tell you that he's more targeted also. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dr. Shiva. Well, let's, can we just throw one thing in there for Dr. Sinha, I mean, I would say, again, the field that just rockets forward with leaps and bounds is radiation oncology. I mean, at this point, um, you're, we are able to target tumor deposits that, you know, are, are anywhere from five millimeters to five centimeters with laser precision and almost zero collateral damage. And those techniques just continue to evolve. And you can target those tumor deposits anywhere they exist in the body, whether it's within the brain, where we have no room for collateral damage, or elsewhere in the body, the liver, the lungs, what have you. Right. So what, Dr. Shiva, do you think is the hardest thing for patients once they've been given a diagnosis of cancer? So they come to your office, you give them a diagnosis of cancer. What is the hardest thing on the patient at that, at that time? So uh, majority of the patients, uh, when I see them, especially we are seeing more and more younger population, they 
tell you they've been eating healthy, they've been exercising. Why did this even happen to them? And that is the hardest thing to tell that you have something that in your body that's clonally multiplying and can kill you if not treated. And that gives them a big setback. It's not like having high blood sugar. It's not like having uh, hypertension. It's something which can cause mortality. So that is the biggest, and that's a setback. And they're in denial. Like, how can I get cancer? And I see that a lot lately in the last uh, year, I would say a lot of younger population are getting cancer. So that's become a little challenging. Right. So I'm going to start with Dr. Nathan. and I'm going to ask you the same question. So when a, someone is presented with a life-threatening diagnosis, what happens to them? And what can you recommend as a particular coping skill for them to recover from that new diagnosis? Um, as Dr. Sinhal um, said, it, getting a life-threatening diagnosis um, it is shocking and it's very difficult to deal with. And um, there is no easy way. There is no easy solution. And I think when we think about resilience, human resilience, and how do we cope with any number of things, uh, the thing that I want to say is um, we, we do, as we are talking about personalized medicine, we want to think of the person and each person is different and what might be the thing that kind of breaks me would be very different for someone else. So again, I would just kind of go with the idea of it, it, it's not anyone's fault when we get anything. And I think as a society, we, there's a lot of blame about it. So when people say, well, I did everything right. Uh, how did this happen to me? Um, that that blame, I think, and feeling like I did something wrong and that's why I got this, that that's sort of the underlying thing. And I tend to kind of look at it and address it. Um, Psychiatry now, I think, is becoming more um, accepted. There's less stigma, and people are talking about anxiety and depression, especially in the post-COVID era. Um, and for me, ultimately, when you think about the point, there's a coping mechanism when someone gets a diagnosis, whether I think a long time ago when I worked, I think um, it was HIV, so getting something like that, you know, for which there's not a lot of treatment. You can go either one way. Some people say, oh, my God, you know, my life, I, I have a lot of things I'm grateful for, and I'm going to go this way and think about all those things. And the other, another set of people say, well, my God, you know, this kind of, um, my life is ruined. You know, I, I, didn't, I don't deserve it. And, you know, how do you support either, either, either way? I think you need support and resilience. And I think connections, I would just say, that you have that support, even as a Surgeon General recently spoke about, you know, connections as a community, how do we thrive and flourish despite setbacks we have, we're dealing with chronic medical conditions as we live longer, or now that there are better treatments for cancer, we have more cancer survivors, and the data does show there's lots of depression, either with dealing with the diagnosis or with some of the treatments that you uh, undergo, um, I, I would stop there. And, yeah. uh, well, so I have a, a terminology for it and everyone always laughs at me for, for my funny words, but so I call this a life quake. So the, the life quake is really- I've, I've heard that one before. Yeah, well, because you get a di I mean, life quakes can be good or bad, right? Having a, a pregnancy and a child is a life quake. Your whole world is different post-children than before children. And the same thing with cancer is that it's, it, there's a definite before and after. And- what I find often is that we have this idea that the world is going to go back to the way it was before. And it often isn't exactly like that because you can't undo what you just, you, you can't unbe pregnant. You have to, <laughs> you know, you have the, the child is there. So now the world is different. So I think that the resiliency skills that you build up over over a lifetime of having different challenges also helps you with the challenge of cancer. Although the challenge of cancer is a little bit more than, as Dr. Shiva said, was about, um, about diabetes or high blood pressure. Somehow those don't seem as life-threatening as the cancer word. So even if you have a precancerous lesion, it's still the cancer word. And so it still affects people very, very strongly. And so, Dr. Dormy, do you uh, do you have any insight on why the cancers are coming to younger people? Well, before before I get there, I mean, what what we're touching on here, the psychology, is such an important thing, and sort of one of the foundational elements of the way I practice oncology. I just wanted to touch on that for a second. I think one thing that that I've seen over the years that helps 
patients cope initially is when their doctor or team of doctors has a plan. You know, this, this event occurs, I think that's a great word. I've heard all of Shamli's catchphrases, but I haven't heard life break before, but that, that is what it is. And so in the middle of a you know, natural disaster, you want an escape plan. You want a safe, you know, a safe pastures or safety route. So I think it's incumbent upon the medical oncologist to walk in the room and present a confident plan. And there are sort of two types of confident plans. So the patients whom you meet before a cancer has metastasized and the presentation of the plan in that setting has to be how we're going to cure this forever. We're going to do this, the inside the box thinking, and then we're gonna think about anything else we can do beyond that to make sure this cancer never enters your life again. And for patients with metastatic disease, it's a much different ballgame, but it, it's, all, it's all within, uh, you know, how you, it's all how you frame it for the patient. What I always tell them is, I understand the cancer has moved, but I don't want you to get up into, I don't want you to get caught up in, I have stage four disease. I have a terminal diagnosis. I always tell them, you don't have an expiration date tattooed on the bottom of your foot like a carton of milk. What I, and I, what I always tell them is, I want you to throw all of that thinking out the window. You have a medical condition, just like diabetes or high blood pressure. And with all the technology and tools we have, we're going to formulate a recipe personalized for you to keep your condition under control indefinitely, just like high blood pressure and diabetes. And I think in this day and age, as with our first question, things are changing so much that even patients with metastatic disease whose, whose statistical expectation for living may have been in the order of three to six months. For many of those patients, it's now three to six years, you know, and maybe beyond. Sometimes you have super responders where despite stage four disease, the cancer goes away. And I think emphasizing those sorts of features play, really helps patients psychologically. The only other thing I would say, since we're talking about psychology, I'm sorry to be loquacious, but it, I think we all feel so passionately about how we take care of patients. You can't stop talking sometimes. Uh, the, the one thing I was gonna say really quickly is, you know, cancer is a life break and it's horrific. All the fear, it's overwhelming. It's, it's always surreal almost. You can't believe it's happening to you as the patient. But what I've also seen over the years in an inspirational way, the diagnosis has this bizarre silver lining where most of the patients, all the mundane things we take for granted every day, every interaction with your children, your spouse, every day trip you take, all of a sudden takes on this almost, you know, this, this meaning and importance and significance that every moment is, is real and, and, and um, precious. So, no, I'm sorry. Now, you're going to answer my question, <laughs> the actual question I asked you. So the, the thing is, is Dr. Dormady was quoted in on CNN uh, discussing um, cancer of the colon and how we have seen much more cancer of the colon in younger people. And so much so that they have uh, moved the first age of colonoscopy and cancer, colon cancer screening from 50 to 45. So maybe you'll comment just a bit on that whole discussion that's out in the news and such. Sure. The answer is much shorter for this one. We don't know. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the truth. I mean, if you read the article uh, in which I, uh, or to which I contributed there, um, basically experts from around the world at the largest cancer centers, um, you know, the comments I made, it's very clear when you read the article that no one knows. But there, nonetheless, there is an increase in the incidence of certain cancers uh, in younger patients. So, you know, the, the only thing I was thinking, if you're arguing on a nature versus nurture argument, there are patients, young patients who develop cancer at a very early age who are born with a, a genetic mutation, a genetic syndrome, 
for example, Lynch syndrome, which wildly increases the risk of colon cancer and rectal cancer over a patient's life. But the incidence of those genetic syndromes is not increasing. So if you can't blame it directly on genetics, uh, and we're not talking about the older population because we're living longer and more cancer is seen here and we're detecting it better with colonoscopies. We're not talking about that either. So the only thing left to focus on is nature and environment. And so over the, over the past you know, two decades, is there a shift more to computer work, more sedentary jobs, um, not taking care of oneself maybe the way we should. Um, I think with the internet, social media, and younger people, I mean, only speaking personally with, with my son, I would need a crowbar and or dynamite to pull him away from his PlayStation. <laughs> and he's he only surfaces to grab pizza, chips, you know, fast food. Yes. You know, I think, I think environment and uh, nutritional factors must be playing a role. There may be a role with the population as a whole being a bit more sedentary. I think, you know, probably um, there's some there's some relation to that. I mean, with billions of dollars being poured into marketing for fast food, sodas, soft drinks, energy drinks, what have you, there may be some component there, but I'm, I'm not sure that explains it all. So. So I'm going to ask Dr. Shiva, so what do you advise your patients for a healthy lifestyle? What do you tell them? Well, I think on to what Dr. Dormady said, they don't know. But um, uh, human body is composed of mind, body, spiritual health, and nowadays they add financial health. So uh, mind, body, and uh, spiritual health is the component of our body. So I'm being mentally healthy, physically healthy, and spiritually. All three components add to it. So once you're diagnosed with cancer, I do advise them to go for walks, to continue exercise, even when they're on chemo, uh, and then post chemo, uh, lifestyle changes. Mental health uh, is actually very big, and I think Dr. Nathan will uh, add on something to it. I strongly feel, adding on to what our Dr. Dormady was saying, mental health is very different if you see your parents versus what you are. It's become a big issue going forward, and we all saw it during COVID. So I think a um, lot of stress, youngsters are taking a lot of stress is in the elderly population because we are not living three generations together anymore. So stress could be one of the factors we don't know. The way I advise my patients is to um, be in a unity with your mind, body, and soul so that you can combat the biggest disease that has happened to you. And that's what, and obviously eating healthy diet, but not during chemo. Chemo, you should eat during chemo. Don't try to lose weight. Yeah. So I have this uh, definitional thing. So there's a, a disease versus an illness. So a disease, we treat the disease. We have data, we have all of these things, but illness is really the impact of that disease on your life. And so this idea that your mind, your body, and your spirit have to be connected is really in the illness portion and the healing of that disease, right? So it's, it's a little bit of a, a philosophical existential topic, but <laughs> there is a difference between treating a disease and treating an illness. And when we talk about treating the whole patient, really what we're saying is that we want to make sure the disease goes away, but there's all this impact of that disease on the person that may be big, may be small, but it's still impact. And those things have to be addressed. Otherwise you don't really turn forward to become a, a you know, to live your life the way that you want to live your life, despite having a diagnosis of cancer. And um, so I, I'm going to go back quickly to the nutrition issue. And so we used to have, we have a program here at, at El Camino called Cancer Healthy Program. And I'll only just point this out is that there are some guidelines and Cheris will, our nutritionist will talk a little bit more about them, but the ideal meal that people are supposed to eat is when you look down at your 10 inch plate, you're supposed to see a third starch, a third protein and a third fruits and vegetables, but a more cancer healthy meal is a quarter starch, quarter protein, half fruits and vegetables. And when you eat the fruits and vegetables, they should be the colors of the rainbow and Cheetos doesn't comprise orange. <laughs> 
<laughs> so unfortunately, you have to pick something else in the orange category. Um, so those are those are a couple of uh, a couple of things. And so let's talk a little Can bit. Can I just say yeah, one quick thing? Yeah. Oh, you made me you laugh. Cheetos? No, no, not the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brian, do you have any Cheetos, by the way? <laughs> um, basically, what I wanted to say was again speaking to mentality of the the unification of your mind, body, and spirit. I I think that was a great comment by Dr. Shiva Single. That's correct. I, I always say that to the patients too. And one thing I say to them because I try to give some concrete examples from the real world. I was given the example of Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan was interviewed once and, he, and uh, the interviewer said, well, do you believe you're gonna win the championship every year? And he said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, they said to him, well, isn't that like a little bit arrogant? And he said, arrogant. He said, no, how can I win the championship if I don't expect to win the championship? And so I use that example with, my patients and say, I want you to be believe that you're going to have the best outcome imaginable, because then we will. You, you know, the, the mind is so powerful in its connection to the body. I've watched patients will themselves to miraculous outcomes. And conversely, I've seen patients who couldn't sort of conquer the original stigma of why did this happen to me and kind of not being able to move out of the victim's mentality will themselves to very poor outcomes when they should have had good ones. So um, just another thought there. Yeah, so I'm going to ask Dr. Nathan a little bit about mindfulness and a little bit about yoga. Uh, there's data to say that yoga, mindfulness, uh, meditation, Tai Chi, all of these types of um, exercises for the mind and the body lead to better outcomes in terms of side effects and any any thoughts about why that yes. why that is um, before i move on I, I i just want to say it's amazing to hear the medical oncologists and surgical oncologists here talk about the connection of the mind and body and i i really do appreciate it ultimately when you go to the physician i'm going to start out how you said about the plan I think when you get the diagnosis, people's minds usually go blank and they often say they didn't even hear what was said. So simplifying and providing that uh, real clear plan and that support, I think is the first thing because you're acknowledging it's, it's about the person, it is personalized. You know, one, one part of it is genetics, but how you deliver that news and how you make them feel. And that is a huge component, the rapport, and for you to trust this person who's going to treat you and how they kind of address you. So, And it's amazing to kind of hear about the mind-body. I think uh, Dr. Sinhali said the spirit and, and you know, um, these are things we normally don't talk about. Or I'm mean, just going to move on to the nutrition piece also. So the lifestyle medicine, regardless of that, I think I, I do believe your exercise, you, you have the moving of the body, regardless of as we get older or whatever we do, the exercise and nutrition is so big and the rainbow plate. Um, and moving on to the stress management piece is also lifestyle. Connection is a big part. They, they say, why does Mediterranean, I usually say Mediterranean diet works not because the diet is good, but because you hang around with your friends and family and chat for hours while you eat the meal. So it's not so much, it's good to eat healthy, but it's the connections that make. And one part of it is the stress management and the ties into the mindfulness. Uh, for me, a lot of it over the years, a mindfulness is the answer to everything I want to say. It's a very simple concept, but very, very difficult to practice. So what, what is it? It is just observing yourself, your mind, body, and your soul or spirit, separating yourself and just giving that space to look at it in a non-judgmental way. So if I were to pause and say, oh my God, I'm having this thought. Oh, oh, oh my God, I shouldn't be feeling this way. So we judge ourselves. Uh, we are own, we are harshest critiques of ourselves. So practicing self-compassion, that ability to just step out, say, these are my thoughts. And when I feel this way, when I have these thoughts, I want to act this way. And if you were to just pause for a minute, so we don't have to do anything right away. And that ability to create that space, uh, Viktor Frankl, you know, who wrote the book about uh, search for meaning, he's, you know, the creating that space in that, that, that is the power that we do have, empowering oneself, so we are not a um, um, 
the self-efficacy model is also my, my ability to manage my anxiety and depression, the things I can do with the help of your uh, physician and the whole team to support you. Uh, but the part that I can do it and I can manage it, these are the things I want in life. Um, with that, I'll, I, I do have a, the role of uh, yoga, I think is an amazing thing. Um, where your mind and body, everything kind of connects. And I think um, Dr. Sinhal practices it more regularly than I do. <laughs> so, That's right. But for me, I think I try to keep my expectations low for the day. So I, I would like to practice 20 minutes of mindfulness each day, but often I don't. But even if I notice that my mind is wandering and I bring it back to the present, I bring it back to my breath, that, that in itself, you know, when we think about depression, it's not so much the neurotransmitters anymore, serotonin or norepinephrine, dopamine. We also think about the networks. So in the networks, there is a, you know, there are different kinds of networks. And one is uh, where my mind is wandering. Um, uh, you, you know, you're shifting those kinds of networks. I can talk a lot more about it, but I'm going to pause right there. So there's a lot of data to show how mindfulness can be effective for uh, how we deal with life stressors. Right. So I, I have spent uh, probably the last couple of years researching and, and looking at what's actually the data. So there's a lot of data for exercise and it doesn't have to be um, intense exercise, 150 minutes, five times, 150 minutes a week of active lifestyle. Now active lifestyle can mean walking around Costco. I mean, we're not talking about a Zumba or uh, intense cardio or any of those things. It's active lifestyle and trying to keep your body mass index under 25, which is very difficult and it's uh, it's one of those one of those items that's a target maybe not uh, shouldn't be come a stressor for people but exercise and the and the ideas around exercise have been well published about how how it improves your health right then there's some things about yoga which you may or may not uh, realize but yoga in the patients that practice yoga regularly, they have about a 25% reduction in side effects of nausea, vomiting, fatigue, um, just general malaise, if you want to call that, during, during treatment and in the cancer survivorship era, where they just feel much better. Now, why do they feel much better? It's not really all that well documented. Many people, I mean, some of it's about the exercise and endorphins. Some of it is just about taking the time out to, to do something that is relaxing for yourself. And, and so I've often wondered, okay, so we have all these tools, right? Here, there's a coping tool here. There's a coping tool there. Do you find that the patients take those coping tools when you present it to them? Or is that something that, that they don't often use? Actually, they often ask for the coping tools. Um, they want to know what else they can do to manage their toxicity. They ask, can they do integrative medicine? Can they do some Ayurvedic treatments? Can they do some Chinese treatments? Because the toxicity, so when we do chemo, we have some toxicity, like some drugs causes neuropathy, some drugs cause nausea, vomiting. Although I have to say nausea, vomiting, we can manage now with our uh, anti-nausea meds very well. So biggest problem which we see is fatigue. Fatigue is immense. And the second biggest problem we see is neuropathy, which is very debilitating. Um, in those terms, uh, the coping mechanism could be many, as you rightly said, could be if you are having mental issues like depression, anxiety, we have them see a psychiatrist. We have a very good psychologist in our cancer center. We have our patients see them. If they're having physical aspects like neuropathy or any other, then we have medications and then we use these agents like Chinese acupuncture or alternative medicines, but they do work. They do help add on uh, to the treatments we give to support that. And I wanted to add one more thing to the yoga. My mom being a yoga teacher, yoga actually is a way of life. Every healthy individual should do at least 15 to 20 minutes. And it is something you have to learn to do right. And if you really do it, you feel really happiness in worldly inherently. It's not something to connect with the environment. It's to connect within yourself. And that helps to become healthy, both mentally and physically. So I'll leave it on to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I have a thought there. I'd, I'd be to answer Shamli's question more broadly. Um, do patients use the coping mechanisms? And that depends on the patient. 
you know, some of them earnestly, <clears throat> you know, we're all human beings, it's not a surprise, but with everyone being different, some patients take every coping mechanism, uh, all five family members in the room are writing every one of them down and they implement every one of them to a T, but you know, even those patients, it's hard. Are they, are they intellectually doing it or are they really applying the uh, salient principle there and really being mindful and using it the way it can help? That is hit or miss as well. Other patients just want to hear the, what's, you know, what possible ways they can cope with things and don't do any of them and come into the office and ask you the same question every visit for 10 years consecutively um and we're all human and i you know and when that happens i think it's incumbent on us as the medical oncologists i typically just smile affectionately at the patient and say as we've discussed <laughs> you know we and we kind of giggle a little bit but then i say you know we go through it again and that's reassuring to the to that type of patient. The only other thing I was going to say in terms of when I hear mindfulness, one other thing that I bring up to the patients and often suggest, and um, because this is important in my own life, and so I often will ask patients, you know, what is your faith? Uh, and well, whatever faith that might be, I encourage them to also use that as a way to be introspective to pray if that's what they do in their religion and and i think just hearing what we're saying here that's also an avenue to mindfulness uh and and healing frankly in many cases i think the one nice thing about the discussion of faith is if you can adopt the idea that or I, I should say i think it helps patients of strong faith when they can sort of unload the things they know they can't control into this area and just focus on, okay, the doctor said this, let's try this, we'll do this, we'll manage this symptom and leave the things they can't control in God's hands or whatever their faith may be. Just, just a thought. Yeah. Well, so I have, I have had this concept for a bunch of years that you know, you, you talk to the patients, everything's so overwhelming. They really cannot hear another thing. And so that people tend to focus on the treatment details. Am I going to get surgery first? Am I going to get chemotherapy? Am I going to get this? How's it going to work? What's the detail of this? Do I have a ride? You know, and it becomes very concrete. And what I've tried to encourage people to do is, is to do something that I call prehab. Okay, so you're going to prepare your body and your mind and everything for this treatment that you're going to undergo. And that preparation is like preparing for a marathon, if you will, right? You wouldn't go to the marathon never having run as a step in your life, right? So why wouldn't you take some of these coping skills and some of this thing that which is prehab, right? And prepare your mind, prepare your body, prepare your soul for something that's going to be hard, right? We know it's hard. But take the time to invest in yourself so that the treatment and everything is better, right? But it's, it's hard for people, and I get that, because it's so much overwhelming detail that you don't understand about the, the, you know, the medication. Does it this? Does it that? What about this? Can I eat this? Can I go here? Can I work? You know, all of that jumble leads to that blank stare that the patient's looking at you, that they're not hearing what you're saying, which is why they say bring somebody with you so that they can capture all of those things. And uh, so I would like to, uh, I would like to go to a slightly uh, different topic and kind of the, the big elephant in the room for cancer patients. What do I do about my fear that cancer is going to come back? What do I do about that? Shiva? So, we have lots of tools these days uh, to come back the fear that this is going to come back. Number one, you need to just uh, leave all your fears to your oncologist. And you should be mindfully know that you're going to be able to combat this. As, as Dr. Dombardi said, keep an eye that on the goal that we're going to get rid of this and it's going to go away. So that's the one way to get rid of the fear in your mind. Because all these negative thoughts do affect you somewhere in your whole body. 
Number two, the way we clinically have, scientifically have to combat the fear is we have tools of scanning. Based on the guidelines, uh, if you have metastatic disease, we have a three monthly guidelines of scanning patients. If the cancer does come back, we have more treatment options, which are genetic, uh, you know, looking at your genes and then targeting it. So we have lots of tools in this era to come to attack the cancer, even if it comes back. If you are cured of cancer, the chances of cancer recurrence, depending on the type we got, is minimal. And so we meet you, we examine you, and we do blood tests. And these are the ways to be able to combat the fear. And then I personally feel if you're doing the lifestyle changes, that helps to overcome the fear as well, especially exercise and uh, yoga and meditation. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in Dr. Nathan's thoughts on this. The only thing I would want is, uh, I don't have more to add to them than what Shiva just said. But I think you, you're going to have the best answer. My only thought is that the scans, the scans do have a double-edged sword. You know, one of my patients famously said, uh, I said, you seem a little worked up here at this visit. Why is that? And he says, I have scanxiety. <laughs> and I always, I thought that was a great term because the scans, while they're a huge relief when you don't see anything on them, they also directly fuel the fear of cancer recurrence before you get them. So, but anyway, I'm, I'm very interested to hear what you said, how to manage the fear afterwards, because this is a big deal. I, I would kind of normalize that. I think it's it's normal to have it. I think it, as human beings, all these emotions that we feel, so it'll be hard not, you know, I, I can't imagine going to, through something like this and not experiencing fear. So that's the first thing I would say. And, um, I kind of want to go back to all the coping strategies. And I think the fear element, if I were to stay on one more minute with that, is you did so much to overcome the first time. And then you have to keep going back over and over again to get scans and monitoring. And that causes mental fatigue in addition to the fear element, I think. So that is what we kind of look at a lot. But the coping strategies, I think I want to kind of go back to the you know, you talked about faith and I, so intrapersonal, my own, my thoughts, my emotions, my actions, interpersonal, my relationships and how those are, I could, it's always a balance. I think I could get enmeshed with certain things or I may have trouble with intimacy once I have all these issues. So looking for balance there. And then it's a transpersonal element. Even if you didn't believe in God, it, it's good. The faith is an important element for all of us. Um, but even if I didn't, where am I going? What's my purpose? What, what is it? You know, what is this life? This is the life. Um, you, you, this is my story at the beginning of Michelle Obama's becoming is, even if it is, it's not pretty or beautiful, even if it is more real than it wanted to be, this is my story. You know, this is who I am. You kind of have to own that piece. And then where do you go from there? Um, and I think the believing that something, some bigger purpose that you don't kind of hold on to say this, you know, um, I did something wrong, I deserve this punishment, or those kinds of the issues that I would kind of um, allay. And um, e e these are sort of bigger issues, I guess, when you think about how do we, um, and I want to go back to touch on one thing, uh, Dr. Singhal said at the very beginning, your life has changed. You know, think of Traumatic events change, and I think it shatters my whole worldview. We build our worldview assuming so many things. And when your health, health is one of the most personal things. When that is, you know, it shakes your whole world and your world just drops. That's kind of what, and you have to reimagine everything. But you can't go back to your life before. And I think that, and I, you, when you try to create where you need it to be before, um, I think to let go of that, because sometimes resilience, if you let go and you go, people actually go in your way you end up going could be even better than where you were. It's all about resetting those expectations and the satisfaction and how you go on to do amazing things when you do end up having these personal challenges. We see that over and over again with people. And that is that faith, that faith to allow yourself to rise about those challenges and not to the fear keeps us here and letting go and it's a surrender is a powerful word. You know, that's the very first step. And we say in AA, right? You surrender when you have something and you look for the support and you rise about. Um, and that's a possibility for all of us, whatever the uh, trauma might be. What a beautiful answer. That yeah. is almost poetic. Uh, some things you said there really resonated. I love what you just said. 
that you can be saying that to the patient that maybe you can be better than before. This is the catalyst to something you could never dream of. That's I'm gonna I'm gonna use that with your permission. Yes. <laughs> and I, I love I love what you're saying. It this is my story. Okay, maybe a little maybe a little ugly. <laughs> Got some smudges on the pages, but this is my life and to own it like that. I love that. I want to use that one too. That's yeah. great. No, that's great. And so I I have this idea that you know people have this monster on their shoulder that that's there, and the monster on their shoulder keeps them looking backwards because the monster's gonna eat them. Like it, came, cancer came out of the blue. They didn't expect it. And so they're always fearful now that something will come out of the blue that they couldn't cope with or that they didn't know was coming. And we, we ha deal with risk all the time, like, you know, from simple things to big things, right? You, you didn't realize that you had to go to a baby shower today and you don't have a gift. Okay. That's kind of a simple maybe a non-life-threatening thing, but it happens all the time. Depends on the family. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, you know, you, you have this stuff that comes up that's unexpected, right? This one happens to be a big unexpected. But because it happened once, does that mean that you're now going to be sitting there looking over your shoulder, waiting for that monster to come get you the second time, right? And so that turning around so that you're facing forward and not paying so much attention to the monster I think is the thing that some people are able to do better than others, mm. right? And some people close the door on cancer and say, listen, I'm done. Don't tell me that word again. I'm, I'm over with that. But other people, it's a part of their daily world, right? And so their daily world is cancer world, right? It's about uh, all this stuff related to their cancer and the rest of their lives are overshadowed by the cancer world. And so it's, it's just a difference of way people look at these and, you know, you can simplify it to glass half empty, glass half full, but it's not that simple. It's just when you're dealing with an illness that is as intense as cancer, there's a period of time where all of your conversation is about cancer, right? It's, am I going to my appointment? Am I not? Am I this? Am I feel well? Everybody's calling you and very concerned. How are you feeling? And there's no relief from that. Right. And so the relief from that is in the partners that you have. It's in the friends that you have. It's in all of this stuff that goes with the healing process. But you don't necessarily realize that those are such big parts of your healing process. That's my take on some of this. Yeah. Um, I, I just had one other thing yeah. to say to not to play psychiatrist or psychologist, mm -hmm. but see, see if you think this is valid at all. I think. What I've often thought of is that these types of events, life quakes and trauma, you know, they sensitize a patient's nerves. And when that event happens, that is such an intense charging of your, of your fight or flight response. that It's almost like a scar that needs to be healed from. And what, one, one thing that I always try to tell patients regarding this topic is, if you are there every day, the, the two words, what if, are terrible words, terrible words, because what if the cancer comes back? What if I can't handle the treatment next time? It's the gateway to all of that overwhelming fear and anxiety. So I try to make them conscious that any sentence that starts with what if, we're going to throw that one in the wastebasket. We're just going to pass through us it's just a feeling don't be afraid of it and then as time passes it will become less and less sensitizing yeah what so, do you think of that do you buy that yeah, yeah. <laughs> i i would say if i may add on i think when something traumatic yes your body responds right so a trauma is then you're sensitized you're going to expect things to fall apart all the time mm -hmm. right, but i think right. then the sympathetic you know when you're in that state and that is because your body says, you know, bad things have happened in your life and something else is going to mm -hmm. be around the corner and you're constantly in that heightened alert and you know, alert state. For that, I think I'm going to come back to the mindfulness and mm -hmm. then the meditation is really the parasympathetic system. So as we take a deep breath or diaphragmatic breathing, we take a deep, you know, abdominal breathing and you push your diaphragm down as you inhale and it goes all the way down to your belly and expand with the diaphragmatic breathing. 
your that impinges on your vagus nerve and that activates your parasympathetic system and your heart rate goes down so then you're getting the more you meditate the more you're you know you salivate more because you know you're relaxed because that's digestion the sleep and so you can balance out and you can cognitive behavioral therapy is reframing those thoughts yes this bad thing has happened but there are lots of good things that have happened in my life so you have to so i'm not constantly charged like that right looking around the corner with the fear so you rethink about the, the big picture and reframe those thoughts and the emotions it's this too shall pass you know the fear comes and it it goes away there is a anticipatory anxiety but there's a baseline anxiety so if i practice more meditation i exercise i do i can hike or you know you know it's forest bathing you can call it we can go for a hike just 20 minutes away and forget about what's happening and then i bring my baseline anxiety down mm -hmm. so the anticipatory life is going to throw other challenges but it'll go like this as opposed to if i'm here any single thing will throw me off so those are the things i can't the challenges are going to be there at life and that that is the way to and fear might be there but it's a manageable if it's here and it's i can manage and ride those waves it's like learning to surf if you fight the waves you drown but you have to kind of that that light life i think as it you have to flow with it and not go against you know going against always um it is a battle but one thing I, I always try to go you know not fight you know that's been my kind of go to but lately i heard a thing it's a beautiful thing sometimes you do have to go upstream <laughs> but it's with intent and i think also sometimes you do have to fight for the things that matter in life but most times not taking on too many battles uh, there are only so many hours in a day and what what do you want with the connections and the things that we value in life and how am i going to do that am i going to do x y and z and i that's the bigger picture and how i think about life in general no that's nice. great that's, that's great fits right in with our our philosophical bent and so i'm going to talk a little bit about cancer survivorship okay because so when dr shiva do you say someone is a cancer survivor so the cancer is called cured once for five years, you haven't had any recurrences. And that's a cure. Um, so that's a survivor. And for metastatic disease, people live long nowadays. So that's in remission. That's also survivorship, but by definition, when you have been uh, diseased for five years. All right, so cancer, so it's, it's a little bit complicated because we have people who have, um, metastatic disease, but because of the drugs and because of the constant new ways to do things, we have lots of patients that live with metastatic disease and they, they live very well with metastatic disease. And you wouldn't take, I mean, they're back to work, they're back to whatever they were doing, they come in for their treatments and then they get on with it, right? And then there's remission and, but survivorship is, is a little bit of a mental state, I think. Yeah, and Dr. Dormy, what do you think about survivorship? When does that start? Oh, <clears throat> well, I agree with Dr. Shiva Singel that the statistical time frame we often use is five years, you know, and within that there are other sub milestones, you know, the biggest one probably being at two years from your completion of treatment for most cancers. And now we're just talking about pure unadulterated statistics, the overwhelming number of recurrences, if you're treating a patient with the intent of curing them, those recurrences occur within the first two years. And so at the two-year mark, usually whatever surveillance plan you have implemented, which is usually seeing the patients every two to three months with blood tests and doing imaging study studies or scans every six months. And that's broadly speaking, that's not for everyone, but it's usually something like that. When you hit the two year mark, I always, we always kind of high five and celebrate and say you, you graduated. And from there at the two year mark, because the incidence of recurrence does reduce dramatically, we can usually move the surveillance every six months with blood tests and once a year, the imaging studies until we hit five years. Now I'm, I'm careful at five years 
because I do, we do celebrate. I say, you know, statistic, statistically speaking, you are now cured and um, we won't do any more surveillance imaging because at some point, um, radiation exposure from scans and so forth can become a factor. You can't tell a 40 year old patient that they'll be getting CT scans once a year for the next 50 years. That would be dangerous. Um, the reason I say statistically though is because patients will invariably have a friend or a relative or see something on television where the cancer recurred 15 years later or 12 years later. And so you just have to choose your words a little carefully um, and tell them that, you know, but statistics would say the chances of a late relapse like that happening are <clears throat> far, far less than half a percent of patients. I try to reassure them that way. It gets back, it gets back, it gets, you know, and then that, and that <clears throat> time frame, it again comes back to mindfulness, doesn't it? To yeah. just say you're statistically cured, but keep practicing everything you implemented on this whole journey because that will not only reduce the chances of a late recurrence, but also reduce the chances of developing another cancer and probably also reduce the chances of non-neoplastic disease becoming an issue, right? So there's, there's kind of a transition that happens for patients. So they're actively being treated and then they're going to surveillance. Right. And the active treatment people, we're here every week. You can call us anytime. We're, we're right on it because you're getting treatment. Right. And then there's this sort of, oh, well, you've graduated now. And so now you're being surveillance and we see you every six months. But then there's some sensation of loss that somebody's not watching you so carefully. But I like to think of it a little bit more like you've graduated. We, you don't have anything that anybody has to look at every day. Right. So it's like going from the ICU to the regular floor to the outpatient setting, right? But the patients feel a little bit un uncertain about who watches them during those periods. And so that's Absolutely. another place of uncertainty. I, I think Dr. Nathan will appreciate this too. Uh, one of, uh, of, I would say, you know, one of my friends and, and mentors in certain ways uh, was an oncologist who practiced here for years, uh, Bill Buckles, who I still think of very warmly and I bump into him from time to time. He's, he's, a, he's a sweet man, but he actually wrote a paper and I still quote the patients about this, this phrase every, every time when we get into this exact area where there is that security of having your blood checked every week and seeing the doctor every week or the nurse practitioner. You just kind of feel like, you know, nothing's going to happen. Everything's being watched. But his quote was disease versus dis-ease. Mm -hmm. I always like that because it was right about that time phrase or time frame where you can sort of leave the nest as a patient and it causes a lot of anxiety. Right. So there's, there's lots of these different places and the cancer survivorship is a lot about um, the, the process of moving forward, right? And it's about the process of dealing with some of the damage of treatment. So maybe you have dry skin, maybe you have cracked nails, maybe you, these were not the life-threatening things of the earlier era, but these are things that bother you. So when you look in the mirror and you see that person looking back and they don't have any eyebrows, then all of a sudden you're like, wow, you know, who's this person there? And so there's there, what you should understand is that there's lots of ways to solve these problems. There, there, you know, there's stuff for your eyelashes, there's stuff for your eyebrows, there's stuff for your hair, there's uh, creams for your skin, there's special kinds of makeup, you know, there's body image stuff that, that, you, can, that you can get to. And so as long as you know that there's resource out there for you, right, it's not something that you have to deal with by yourself. And I think that's what I would say about cancer survivorship is, is restoration would be my word for cancer survivorship. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very uh, positive word for restoring the things that, it's not necessarily, I would call them deficits, but they're changes, right? Changes that happen because you underwent treatment. So now you're gonna restore yourself to the person or the, the way that you want to feel. Right. And I think that that's just kind of a good sensation. I, I don't know how you guys feel about 
what people should do during cancer survivorship that would help them. I think that's well said. Um, I, th I think what I'm hearing from you and, and Dr. Nathan, I love the idea of normalizing the process and saying your fear, it's all normal and, and sort of diffusing the fear. What I always tell patients is we're in a, this is kind of a biological chess match with the cancer cells. And I want to reassure you, Mr. or Mrs. Patient, that it's just a matter of if the cancer makes a move, we have a counter move. So whether that's using <clears throat> the genetics and mutations in the cancer cells to devise a new treatment recipe, or even the counter moves Dr. Shomley singles describing, if your eyelashes fall out, we have medications that can help them regrow. If you're having trouble with your hair regrowing in general, we have a counter move to that. You know, nausea, vomiting, side effects, neuropathy, there's a counter move to everything. And sometimes, you know, our goal is to even stay two moves ahead of the cancer and keep you on maintenance treatment so that it doesn't come back. But I think trying to diffuse this isn't this overwhelming. It, it, it's it's an, a limp, you know there's a move and a counter move. This is almost an intellectual thing. Try to take some of that emotion and fear out of it. Yeah, great. So we have three minutes, and so in our last couple of minutes, I wanted to uh, answer a question that was top of mind last year, and fortunately is not top of mind this year. So if a patient, if a chemo patient gets COVID. Do they ask for Paxlovid? Is that? Yes. Yes. So it's a, a real simple answer. Yes, please do that. Uh, the only thing is if you're on Zeralto, uh, be mindful. Um, be, do to inform your physician. So you shouldn't be on Zeralto and Paxlovid. That's yeah, there are various medicines, you're right. That there are also anti-cancer medicines you can you can be on where you have to hold those for the five days you take Paxlovid. But the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else from the panel that they want to make sure our patients know for this? You know, Cancer Survivors Day is my favorite day of the year. It's it's really the day that we celebrate what we what we have as our patients. We are a community. We take care of each other, and it's you know a, a bunch of years ago we used to have everybody come to the site, and maybe we'll get back to that. But this is a really good uh, middle ground, if yeah. you will. For all the patients watching and listening. Just remember what Michael Jordan said, you can't win your championship unless you believe you can. So believe you can defeat cancer. Great. And so I'm going to let it go on that note. And I appreciate all of your time this Saturday morning. And we will take a, a take a small break. And I think Cheris is coming next. And her, her talk is always so well received uh, and so interesting to listen to. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I am so happy to share with you this today. And I think our topic falls in line greatly with what has been discussed this morning by our panelists. And a lot of that is kind of mindfulness and then and taking that and how we approach nutrition um, and all the bombardment that we get in the news. So I'm going to just give you a few um, thoughts before we get started is if you have questions, please put those in the question and answers um, box and I'll try to get to those at the end. But I'm Cheris Spielman and I've been a dietitian for a lot of years, but I've had oncology experience for about 40 years and it's an exciting dynamic field and I so appreciate working with each and every one of you. Um, you are champions um, and you have approached your life quake with guts and um, with purpose and obviously intention for even because you've shown that for being here today. So our topic today is cancer news and truths. News and truths. And we'll get started. What we're going to do today is decipher nutrition news. I think I, yep, okay, sorry, just <laughs> um, investigate eight nutrition news items. Now I know there's a lot more and we're gonna talk about kind of the, the enormous news that's out there. 
we're going to take some of those news items and recommend what are the truths, what are some key cancer nutrition findings from what we see in the news. And lastly, find balance and reduce food anxiety. And that's part of the mindfulness that Dr. Nathan was talking about. Because today we are bombarded with nutrition information. It's a popular topic. And most people like to eat. So those kinds of headlines grab our attention. And we begin to develop opinions or philosophies about foods, especially regarding cancer fighting foods, because that's the um, life quake that you're in right now. And those cancer fighting foods make the news really often. If you type in your internet browser, you know, cancer nutrition, you get about 600 million hits. Maybe it's, and it's just, it's overwhelming. And so we're, we would just want to demystify some of that because a lot of that information is going to be somebody trying to get your money. It's, um, some of it is actual research, some of it is just anecdotal, and, and it can flood your brain, which is already, again, flooded with everything else, that I like to simplify life and nutrition information for you to reduce anxiety and to give you yet power. And what I like is the theme, eat your best to feel your best. That's what we're really after, both during treatment and beyond. So when you see a news blast, look past the headlines. Don't just read, you know, coffee causes cancer. I mean, read the full report. Um, people are looking for headlines, they're looking for attention grabbers. If you remember ever taking a speech class, you wanted to begin your speech with something that would grab people's attention. It's the same thing with news articles. You know, so you want to read what's really behind it, you know. Um, so and choose trusted news and social media outlets. Is the newspaper, um, is the news an opinion or is it a report? Dig into the details. Is it a conclusion based on a study? Was it just more, was it more than one study? Is it a consensus? And I would like to let you know that there is something called the Continuous Update Project, which takes studies from our nation and internationally, and they update this for every type of cancer. So they're constantly looking at all the research that's been done and coming up with the conclusions that has been based on more than one study and how much um, weight can we give to those conclusions. You know, they grade them. Is it a grade A? It's just like a test paper or, or a grade C. It's, you know, it might be, but we're not sure. So that gives you some basis for making a change in your own choices regarding food. Also, when you see a report, investigate the research. Was it done in the lab, on an animal, or on a human? You know, was it similar or different scenario or health situation than yourself? So instead of getting caught up in it, you know, it does it even apply to you? And know that the red flag warnings are, if it promises a quick fix, it's probably not work, it's not a miracle cure, um, warns of danger from a single product or regimen, like if you ever eat this product again, this is going to happen to you. Or maybe it's just the opposite. The claim sounds like if you eat this every day, life is going to be roses. Or simple conclusions, John, from a complex study. And most of us have whatever field you're in at the end of some journal article, it'll say more research needs to be done on this before you can give a conclusion. So, you know, it's not always that simple. Uh, so dramatic statements, again, those are the ones that, have, that make the headlines, or if they list the good and bad foods, or spinning information from another product just to sell theirs. So let's take a look at some of those most popular ones, and they're not necessarily new ones, but I thought I'd just go over the ones that continue to come up with those that I work with. News blast number one, sugar feeds cancer. Um, before I even go through these eight news blasts, I want to say that in each one, the news blasts, there's usually a nugget of truth, but we need to search for that and not extrapolate it to bring fear and anxiety to our lives. And especially as every time we walk into the kitchen or go to a restaurant or go to the grocery store, that that's not all encompassing for us. So going back to news blast number one, sugar feeds cancer. 
That's the news. That's what we hear all the time. If we don't read it, we're hearing it from our friends and we're being scolded and shamed if we dare eat anything that might feed our cancer. Well, the truth is that all our cells, whether they're cancerous or not, use glucose for energy. That's the chemical name for sugar. We're not able to pick and choose which cells get which nutrients for fuel. So like radiation oncology can target your tumor, but you know, our food cannot target which cells to be fed by what we have just consumed. But what can we talk, what can we learn from this news glass? The recommendation is to avoid sugary drinks and to limit added sugars. So going on with this, natural sugars or carbohydrates, which are found in vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes, which are all your dried beans, um, and unsweetened dairy are major sources of vitamins and minerals. These plant foods are packed with cancer-fighting properties in the form of phytonutrients and fiber, and then dairy has vitamins and minerals and proteins. So yes, if your body, when it metabolizes those foods, it breaks down long chains of carbohydrates into simple six carbon molecules, which are sugar, but along with them, they're bringing your body all these great cancer fighting properties. So, and I will say one other thing about sugary drinks, as you've often heard of a beer belly, they've done a lot of studies and you can get like a sugar belly. It actually, you can maintain weight around the middle just from drinking, getting too much sugar. And you can see here that your 12 ounce soda um, can has nine teaspoons of sugar. So what is also, is there, a, what's the nugget of truth in sugar feeding cancer? The myth that sugar feeds cancer is not completely true, but routinely eating sugary drinks and sugar laden desserts contributes to weight gain. And excess weight gain does increase your insulin levels and what's called insulin glucose factor, and it can increase the risk for factor, for cancer. So added sugars have no cancer fighting properties. And, but you can't exactly cut out all sugar, but there are recommendations for men not to have more than like um, seven teaspoons of sugar a day and women five and in each teaspoon is four grams of sugar and labels will help you distinguish that. And we were um, privileged to be able to a dietitian, another oncology dietitian, Nicole and I, we just produced some videos and one of them, it's, two of them are on sugar and they will be out soon. And we'll talk about how can you reduce added sugars and really the difference between um, sugars that are fight cancer and sugars that don't. Okay, news blast number two, very popular. A ketogenic diet or a very low carbohydrate diet will slow cancer growth. What's the truth? There's always a nugget of truth. Healthy cells shift to ketones for energy. That's what is what happens when you break down fat in your body. And cancer cells can't make that shift. So basically you're able to still feed your healthy cells, but the cancer cells don't get fed as easily. But when you look at the whole evidence for keto, the effect of it really slowing cancer growth, <coughs> excuse me, is missing. So it doesn't show that it really makes any difference. And what is a keto diet? There's a lot of definitions of really what that is. It's not necessarily just cutting out bread, but a true keto diet strictly limits all non-starchy vegetables. So that would be even your legumes, um, whole grains and fruits even. And what that means you get less vitamins, minerals and, and healthy compounds found in these foods. The keto diet can lead to digestive side effects because fat is very difficult to digest. And here you can see a plate where two thirds of your plate um, is just fat and just a little bit of carb and, and, and protein. Very difficult diet to follow. But what is the truth? The recommendation is balance carbohydrate intake. There are times when we do eat too many carbohydrates, but the carbohydrates we want to choose are grains, starchy vegetables, and fruit, and keeping those at a healthy weight. So we're balancing them. It's not too much of one thing and not enough of another. It's a variety of things on our plate because carbohydrate is the body's most efficient fuel source. And carbohydrate foods groups have protective vitamins, minerals, fiber, and phytonutrients. So again, you can see from the bottom of this slide, 
that blueberries for one of the fruits, which is restricted in a keto diet, gives you many um, phytonutrients, which fight cancer as well as vitamins and minerals and whole grains, or you know, anytime you hear about pasta or bread, you know, it gets thrown under the bus and yet it has, look at, it has minerals, vitamins, antioxidants, and, um, and again, that word phytonutrients, which is what is plant compounds that help your body fight inflammation and reduce many diseases. Oops, sorry, jumping ahead. Number three of eight, fasting makes chemotherapy more effective and less toxic. Again, a very popular topic. And the truth is that there's limited human data. Observations indicate that your side effects are less when you're fasting, but there's no change in really, does that make your treatment more effective or less effective? And the key to this is that the risk of undernutrition during treatment is serious when you're fasting. And fasting duration with chemo treatments is not yet determined. So are you supposed to not eat for 24 hours before your treatment and not for 48 hours afterwards? Some of them have been 72 hours without eating. And you can see that already it's difficult. You lose your appetite during treatment and um, you can lose your weight and you don't have the strength to have your next treatment or to build your cells back up. So, you know, it kind of depends on what, you, what works for you. Um, I have seen some patients who might fast the day before chemo and the day after, but they're able to keep, maintain their weight and they may have less side effects, but it's not for everybody and you need to be willing to adapt for what I like to say is what's healthy for you today. So is there any truths to fasting? The recommendation is during treatment, focus on fueling your body to keep it strong. And after cancer treatment, it's not just what we eat, but when we eat. So there is a lot of news and things that we can gain from looking at these studies. And one of them is that overnight fasting, which is greater than 13 hours, improves metabolic health and reduces risk of cancer recurrence. So what that means is like, okay, I'm not gonna eat anything from, from 8 p.m. until 9 a.m. in the morning. And you can see that when you go for blood draws that require fasting, you haven't ate, eaten, <coughs> eaten anything since midnight. And that, because if you do eat, it affects the lab results. So fa fasting improves blood sugar and insulin levels and improves cholesterol and other blood fats and reduces inflammation. So chronic high glucose, higher levels of, higher levels of insulin and inflammation all promote tumor growth. And eating after 8 p.m. can cause more body inflammation and often increased body weight. So again, I would focus on this if this is a, yeah, a item of interest when you're done with your like big boy, big girl treatments, because sometimes you need to be able to eat enough and you might need to have a, a, an evening snack because you need those extra calories and protein in order to maintain your strength and your energy for treatment. News blast number four. Breast cancer survivors and any other hormone related cancer survivors should avoid soy. So eating soy does not increase a women's risk for recurrence or death. And this is human evidence, not lab, not animal. It's also clinical and epidemiological, which means across the globe, overwhelmingly show that the phytoestrogen called isoflavone exposure is not harmful and may even benefit breast cancer patients. Um, and the observational studies for endometrial and ovarian cancers can't conclusively prove that soy protects against these cancers, but it is reassuring that it does not increase the risk of these cancers. And then you go to another hormone related cancer and that's the prostate cancer. And um, the flavonoids or the isoflavones found in soy um, have been shown to promote cancer cell death and so it's encouraged even in that hormone related cancer to eat soy foods. So what's the recommendation with that news blast? Choose whole soy foods in moderate amounts. We don't have to go overboard in anything just because soy is good. That doesn't mean you need to eat it, you know, three times a day or, or every meal. It's actually, you can have one to three servings a day. I was trying to think of like blueberries. Some people say, I'm going to eat blueberries and I'll have them at every meal. You know, we don't need to be so obsessed with that. Let's relax. Let's enjoy our food. 
Um, what we do want to do is avoid powdered or highly processed soy foods. And why should we even think about soy food? Sometimes it's cultural. It's been part of the way we eat for a long time. It's also a great source of plant protein when we talk about plant-based eating. And soy are also good sources of fiber, potassium, magnesium, lots of minerals. So it's a great, very low fat, um, plant-based protein. Um, so it's, and it's no fear for eating soy. News blast number five. Here's another whole food group get, gets thrown under the bus. And I'd like to just take a moment. If you followed the keto diet, you're throwing out your carb, your grains and pasta, you're throwing out your fruit. And then if you're afraid of dairy, you're throwing out your dairy, you're not left with much left to eat. And that takes away the joy of life and the joy of, again, Dr. Nathan talked about connecting and the Mediterranean diet, not so, which is healthy, but also the idea that you're sitting around the table enjoying life. If you start eliminating everything that you're eating, then you can't even enjoy putting a mouth full of food in your mouth because you're so afraid. And so we're trying to dissipate that and, and give you some truths. So the truth is, is that total dairy intake is not associated with any cancer mortality risk. So what does that mean? <coughs> it means mortality risk means this, you're not gonna die from eating milk any earlier. Dairy foods actually can decrease colon cancer risk because of the calcium content and the lactic acid producing bacteria. And there's limited evidence of any link between milk and dairy products for breast or prostate cancers. The only time dairy gets kind of thrown under the bus is that whole fat dairy is associated with higher, and the IGF is insulin group glucose factor, which may increase risk of disease progression. So what do we take away? If you enjoy dairy, choose non-fat or low-fat dairy. If you prefer plant-based milk, so you're lactose intolerant, then choose a plant-based alternative that's fortified with vitamin D and calcium. Why? Because low-fat dairy reduces your total calorie intake. It helps you manage your weight. And routinely eating two servings of dairy or fortified plant-based alternatives helps you meet your daily calcium requirement, which is so important for bone health, particularly if you have a hormone-related cancer, or particularly just as we age, we need um, bone health so we can prevent osteoporosis and so that we are not frail as we age. Again, the whole point is enjoying life to our fullest and at our healthiest. News blast number six. Organic foods can offer extra protection against cancer. So many times we're, you know, before a cancer diagnosis, yeah, we try to eat healthy or maybe it doesn't really matter. And all of a sudden we do not want to do anything that will tweak us in a negative way. And so we get very, again, anxious. But the truth is that eating mostly plant foods reduces your risk and organic foods are not proven to be better. So what's the takeaway here? We just want to eat plenty of brightly colored fruits and vegetables. We talked about the rainbow, which is beautifully displayed here at the bottom of the slide. And many times, you know, the cost of organic foods, um, produce is too high. Many times it's cheaper or, or equivalent and de then definitely go with the organic. And you can reduce exposure to pesticides from non-organic foods by just washing your produce for 20 seconds under running water and sometimes adding some friction with your hands. It is not recommended to use like produce washes. Um, and the other thing you might want to look at is a uh, website called Safe Fruits and Vegetables. So they will tell you that you would have to eat like, yeah, I can't, I don't know a number, but an enormous number of apples before you had a pesticide residue that would be of any concern. And it's not, you could never eat that many apples in, in a month or two months. Um, so that might give you some, help you reduce your anxiety. Um, and what is this recommendation again? Because fruits and vegetables um, don't have, have only trace amounts of pesticides and they're not currently considered to be toxic. And the cancer survivor diet is we wanna have more plant-based vegetables. We wanna be eating not just the two and a half cups of fruits and vegetables recommended for the general public, but we wanna get up to four or five cups of fruits and vegetables a day. So go for organic if that works for you, but don't feel like you can't eat a non-organic or conventional um, produce. News, 
Blast number seven. You hear about alkaline as ash diets or acid, avoid acidic foods. And why choose an alkaline diet? Because cancer cells, cells thrive in an acidic environment. Well, the truth is that foods we eat do not affect your overall body pH. Human bodies tightly regulate your pH levels or else it's life threatening. So it's, so what does it mean to be acid or alkaline in your foods or, you know, it's based on a lab combustion of the food. Now, depending on what you eat, it doesn't change your blood pH levels. It can change the pH of your urine. And that's why many times with um, urinary tract infections, people say, oh, you should drink cranberry juice because it's, you know, <coughs> it's acidic. It will help in that category. But is there any truth to any of this? The recommendation is focus on a plant-based eating style because vegetables, fruits, and seeds are considered to be alkaline. And you can see this graph at the bottom. So you can see that like neutral in the middle is kind of your protein foods and some of your dairy. And to the right, the eight, nine, and 10, the alkaline is all your produce, which we've already been encouraging for a survivor diet. And over on the acidic is some of your higher fat or your red meats, your snack foods, your alcohol, your sugary drinks. Um, so it's just on number five, some of your whole grains are there. But again, eating just alkaline is throwing away um, some food groups. And the ones that maybe we, that are not a concern are ones right in the middle, they're neutral in, in the middle of that pH spectrum. So a diet pattern focused on plant-based ingredients is recommended and go ahead and include whole grains in the glooms, even though they're a little towards the acidic side, because we've seen that they have all these other vitamins, minerals, fiber, which feeds your um, gut microbiome, which is a key part of cancer health as well. And it, But we do want to limit red meat, avoid processed meat, and limit sugary beverages and desserts. Goes back to the healthy cancer survivor diet. News blast number eight. Taking dietary and herbal supplements will boost my health and reduce side effects of treatment. Well, the truth is, is that no dietary or herbal product can cure cancer. Herbs and supplements can even make cancer treatments less effective or more toxic. The products may interact with chemotherapy and other drug treatments. So what's the recommendation? Let's not rely on supplements to prevent cancer. Let's get the healthy compounds from food. And I love the wheel here. Again, it's the colors of the rainbow and you have all your vitamins in the middle. You have a lot of minerals on the outside of the, of the wheel. And it's fine if you want to take some vitamin and mineral supplements. We just ask you to, if you're undergoing treatment, to review those with your medical oncologist or your dietitian because they can see if they are going to make your treatment more effective or, or um, more, less effective or more toxic. There's not enough evidence to weigh the benefits against potential risk of supplements to prevent cancer or reduce side effects. So eating a balanced diet, getting your nutrients from food is the way to go. There are some times when you need to take an additional vitamin. That may be vitamin D. Um, and also according to your particular cancer, if you've had um, any change to your gastrointestinal tract, be it surgically removed or something, there are times when some nutrients are not as well absorbed and you may need to take those in supplement form because your body cannot take all of what the food provides from that um, vitamin or mineral. So your dietitian can help you with that. And it goes back to, this is the plate that um, Shomley Single talked about in the panel, is a new American plate. And it's two thirds or more of your plate is vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans. Um, four to five cups every day is kind of the goal of fruits and vegetables. For protein, which is one third or less um, of your plate, and that you could also use dairy or um, plant-based in that. It's choosing beans, nuts, or seeds for protein at least one meal a day, aiming for 15 to 35 grams at meals and spreading protein out over the day. And this is um, a key aspect. As we age, we need more protein. 
and it, we tend to eat less or we tend not to eat as much protein. And what they have found is that if you eat protein, instead of having your most of your protein at the end of the day, we really want to kind of spread it out because then your body can use protein for what it needs to use it for. You can keep your muscles strong as well as doing the activity, like which was highly recommended in the beginning from the panel. Um, that's something that look at. And so you can read on packages um, often how much grams of protein is in the item. Um, I, the dietitians at the cancer center have protein charts and we can determine what is your goal for protein. Um, using whole grains, two to three cups per day or four to six servings, choosing 100% whole grain and then drinking adequate fluid that's not sweetened beverages. I also wanna make just a caveat here that, again, this is like the picture perfect diet um, and it's something to aim for. You need, we need to look at each individual. And again, if you have had part of your gastrointestinal tract changed because of your, your tumor location, then sometimes you're not able to tolerate maybe 100% whole grains. Um, so we may, so it may not be all of your whole grains. It may be more refined grains. And it doesn't mean you're less healthy. You're doing what your body needs for its best health. And fruits and vegetables, again, depending on if you have any gastrointestinal issues, those can you can choose within that group, maybe more tender cooked vegetables, or maybe you know, you're fine with big salads and you know, broccoli and cauliflower. So there's no um, you're not getting graded on that. You're doing what your body needs but it's choosing each food group, including each one. So, <coughs> excuse me, my hope for you is that you have better knowledge about the evidence regarding nutrition and cancer, that you can drop the guilt, lower your anxiety and enjoy your food. Think about it, is the way you eat, is it a habit? And the 80-20 rule means you know, we have this idea of what a picture perfect cancer healthy diet is. And no one can follow that 100% of the time. If that's your baseline, 80% of the time that's what you're doing, you have built a strong, healthy foundation. It doesn't mean you can never celebrate a, a celebratory occasion by having a piece of pie or a scoop of ice cream or something like that. But have you been feeding and fueling your body with the nutrients it needs you know, to maintain its health for the long run. So again, let's get rid of the guilt. Let's enjoy our food. Food is our ally. It's our defense against many um, health conditions. And it's our way of connecting with people. So keep calm and eat your vegetables, whatever they may be. That's a key part. Um, just kind of to end the main part of this presentation. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer some of those. So let me take a look at the question and answer. Um, eat uh, tomatoes and prostate cancer um, and lycopene supplements. Tomatoes have the phytonutrient called lycopene and it is from your red foods, it's mostly tomatoes. Um, so it has been recommended that you do eat lots of tomatoes and tomato sauces. You know, most of the cans are just pure tomatoes. So when you can incorporate that, that's great. Um, I don't think there's enough information to recommend lycopene supplements. There is a prostate cancer foundation uh, you can look up online. They have a very extensive booklet um, and, I, and they will give you um, ideas about how many tomatoes you should aim for. And again, it'd be hard to eat like four tomatoes a day. Um, but you know, maybe it's every time you have your breakfast, you're adding tomato to your toast or you know to your egg, or you're having tomato on your uh, sandwich or tomato on your uh, plant-based burrito. Times you can include them a bit more. I think that would be fine to do. Um, my opinion about stevia or art artificial sweetener from monk fruit. Um, uh, there are some, I don't have a real strong opinion about any of those, uh, about stevia or artificial sweetener from monk fruit. I think that, um, again, moderation is the key. I think it depends on your individual situation. And is that, if you want something sweet, is that the way to go? A lot of times you can use just a regular 
you know, whether you wanted brown sugar or maple syrup using smaller amounts. I think, again, if you're sweetening it yourself, no matter what um, type of sweetener you're using, you're going to use less than if you buy it that's already sweetened. And it's going to be your choice um, of what type of sweetener. For vegetarians, um, there are plenty of plant-based proteins to choose from. And you can get calcium um, from some of your plant-based foods as well, but you may need to be check your, you know, often you need to check your vitamin D level, check your vitamin B12 level. Um, and if you're aging up, which we all are, you know, maybe you, you have some a bone scan to see how your calcium level is, um, but you can get all your nutrients from a plant-based diet. There is a wonderful reference for people for who are complete vegetarians and it's Sharon Palmer, dietitian, and she's online and she has a very detailed nutrient list and everything for people who are strict vegetarians. So I highly recommend that. Um, and going back to other um, references, um, the American Institute for Cancer Research, which is AICR.org, um, has, is a very user-friendly site and you can type in the search bar blueberries, you can type in the search bar flax seeds, and it'll to give you the information about that particular um, food item, um, what they know about it research-wise, what the recommendations are, maybe some recipes to use it. Um, it's, it's very helpful. Um, um, some questions are in the at the chat box, so let me go back to that. How can I increase red blood cell count? Hold on, let me open this up a little bit. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to read these and, and look at the screen and, and talk to all of you too. Uh, red blood cell count, the best way to increase red blood cell count is really just maintaining your weight, eating a healthy diet, and a lot of times it does require some maybe some blood transfusions. It depends on where you are in your own treatment. It may be part of an iron panel study. That would be something to discuss with your medical oncologist. There's not something specifically to um, diet other than a healthy diet. And which is better, keto or vegan diet, to reduce incidence of recurrence? Um, again, there's not a plant-based diet is recommended. That doesn't mean you have to be vegan. I, I am not a fan of the keto diet because it throws out complete food groups like fruit, like all your grains. It gives you a lot of fat that isn't healthy for heart health. Um, it doesn't give you adequate protein for preventing frailty as you age. So, you know, it goes back to a carbohydrate balance and also including more plant-based foods. Um, another question, some say that eating fish raw and, and sea cucumber are good for our bodies. Is there any scientific support? Um, <clears throat> we usually recommend during treatment that we that all protein foods are cooked. So I wouldn't suggest that there's anything special about raw fish. It certainly is yummy when, when we know that our counts, we're not susceptible to a foodborne infection. There's nothing that again designates that as being a superfood. Um, so, and as far as sea cucumber, that's another kind of vegetable plant-based food. So it would be happy to include that if that works for you. Um, Eggs with prostate cancer, that's another one that's been a concern of many, and that's because of the choline content. And again, I don't think it means you can never eat an egg. I, um, the Prostate Cancer Foundation, all the, they might recommend eating less eggs, and that goes back to even our cardiac diet where it used to be no, don't eat more than egg, three egg yolks per week. It's the egg yolk that um, prostate cancer people are concerned about. And so it's easy enough many times to reduce the amount of egg yolks you use by just using the egg white. If you're baking, you can use a flax egg, which is taking two tablespoons of ground flaxseed with a one tablespoon of ground flaxseed with two tablespoons of water, kind of letting that gel that substitutes for an egg in baking. So that's a way to add um, healthy 
um, fatty acids to your diet, fiber, it's adding um, even protein, and it's cutting out the egg. So I think when it goes to, again, eggs and, pro and prostate cancer, I think, you know, if you when you want to have an egg, eat the actual egg. And when you're using eggs in a dish where you can't tell, use it, use just the egg white or use a flax egg. Are there any other questions? Let's see. Um, uh, <coughs> vitamins and minerals. Okay, let's see. Vitamins and minerals. There are um, taking a taking a vitamin, multivitamin if you don't get enough fruits and vegetables. It depends really are where you are in treatment. Um, if you are in active treatment, depending on your medical oncologist, there are times when um, they don't want you to take any vitamins or minerals. Um, so I would check with your medical oncologist. Generally, a multivitamin is okay. Um, as long as the percentage is not more than 100% of the daily value recommended. Um, I'm not against that personally, but it, again, it, it really would be a great thing to check with the actual medications you're taking to see if they use the same metabolic pathways to break that down, to take a look at what your needs are according to your own personal GI tract. That's helpful to check on. An example of the 80-20 rule, um, another one is again, I'm, you know, I'm eating, trying to eat more plants. I'm trying to eat a vegetable at every time I eat a snack or a, a food. I'm going for half the time with whole grains. I'm choosing healthy proteins, but I'm going to have a chocolate chip cookie today. Fine. Do I need a chocolate chip cookie twice a day? No. Do I need it tomorrow as well? No. It's kind of, you know, every other day I might have a treat, but my foundation again is, is the healthy foods. So it's never saying, no, it's never blacklisting a food completely. It's taking the time to choose those additional foods, making sure there's something that I really want. I mean, I'd rather have a, a my you know home baked cookie than like you know one from a package, and and or I want this specific chocolate, not that one. And a lot of times, it's just a bite will satisfy instead of you know everything supersized these days. It's a supersized muffin. It's a supersized cookie, you know. Um, so it's, it, you know, it goes back to sort of like the petite four sizes. A lot of times that's what is satisfying. And then taking time to really enjoy each bite, let it melt in your mouth, you know, because many times that's all I needed. So that would be an example of the 80-20 um, the rule. Um, Collagen protein powder for cancer patients. Collagen is not a complete protein powder. It certainly can add to your total protein. Um, so there are some thoughts that it might help with like nails or hair. Um, I'm not sure how valid that is, but there's no danger in, or risk, I should say, about using collagen. I think I've answered most of the questions. <laughs> we have a little bit more time. Is there anything I, that anybody wanted me to review? Hey, Jarris, it's Brian. Did, did you see the calcium question in the chat? I wondered if you might have addressed that already. I might have missed that one. Um, calcium is often a, a supplement that women especially need to take, especially if you're a, a breast or a hormone-related cancer or you're postmenopausal. Um, so people who take consistently eat a high calcium a product at each day, like two or three servings, may not need a calcium supplement, but other people would need a calcium supplement. And calcium, you can only absorb it in 500 to 600 milligrams at a time, so you need to divide your doses during the day. Um, so it often is is necessary. So again, it, you, it would be looking at the entire, your individual circumstance, but calcium and vitamin D are often mm -hmm. supplements that are, are needed to add.
Well, I thought this morning's panel was wonderful. And I think it, it, it talked about, again, balance and being mindful, enjoying life, um, prioritizing, you know, the things that will build you up. Nutrition is one of those, um, but not being anxious about it. When you see something new in the news, um, don't fret about it. Look at it um, holistically and and enjoy. <laughs> so I thank you and I hope next year this is live because not seeing all of your faces is just disappointing. Um, I love interacting with each of you when I if I've known you or could meet you. And um, there will be a, a handout coming out um, for those attendees that will list all of my main eight news blasts and some of the um, recommendations. So if you did not take notes or wanted anything else, that will be coming out to you. So we appreciate you taking your time this morning and we appreciate our, our doctors for being there for you. And we just appreciate you and, uh, and your coming to this um, presentation today and really giving it your all to do your best uh, and as we all want to do for our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Cheris. Wonderful presentation. I want to remind everybody that the recording of the event is going to be made available via a YouTube link, which will be distributed. I wanted to also say that we have ha we have heard people's suggestions about closed captioning. Sorry, we were caught a bit off guard on that this year, but we're going to take a very close look at that for next year. And with that, we wish you all a very good morning and thank you again. Goodbye. Thank you.